Hi everyone, welcome to the Mummy Movie Podcast, where we are looking at The Mummy Resurrected from 2014. A film that has a a grand total of 1.8 on IMDb, with the featured review calling it an abomination, so uh, yay, I'm sure we're in for a, a, a real masterpiece here. I should probably just say for the, I don't know, maybe like one person who is tuning in looking for a review on The Mummy Resurrection, this is not that film. This is The Mummy Resurrected, which is completely different. You see, um, The Mummy Resurrected is clearly a film made to trick people into thinking it's, you know, like kind of The the Mummy Returns, you know, the, the Brendan Fraser film, where The Mummy Resurrection... I'm relatively certain it's a film that was made to trick people into thinking it was The Mummy Returns. You know, the the Rachel Weitz film. So, as you can see, completely different. Anyway, uh, for any new listeners out there, for the format here, we shall simply start by having a look over the uh, historical aspect of the film. You know, mainly using it as a a chance to look at uh, interesting areas of Egyptology, the history of ancient Egypt, if you will, And then I shall simply review the film and rate it out of 10. But before then, as usual, it is time for my dramatic intro. Right. You are an up-and-coming Egyptologist who has just reunited with your long-lost father. He is also a professional in the field and wishes to lead you and your colleagues on a fascinating expedition. However... Little do you realise that his motivations are not sincere. Once you have arrived, quickly you find yourself trapped in the tomb. And then, one by one, your colleagues begin to die in suspicious circumstances. Throughout this, although everyone seems suspicious of your father, you cannot bring yourself to accept that he might be behind this. Little do you realise that your denial will lead you to meet the Mummy Resurrected. Okay, so on to the history section. To begin with, at a couple of instances throughout the film, we see the father, Abel, uh, use blood as part of rituals, usually when it comes to killing people in supernatural ways. Now look, I, I really want to stress, everything I'm about to talk about here is tenuous at best. This is not an accurate part of the film at all. I am stretching far and wide to find links here. However, blood and indeed any type of bodily fluid was generally considered to be unclean in ancient Egypt. It was for this reason that, say, a priest was going to uh, serve in the temples in the next few days. First things first, they weren't allowed to have sex before that time, because, again, that involves the swapping of bodily fluids, if you will. There's no way of saying that nicely, is there? Um, But also they wouldn't be allowed to, say, even touch a a woman who was menstruating, for instance. Because again, that was considered unclean and you needed to be pure to go into the temple. Further to this, uh, the colour red did also have evil connotations. For instance, Seth, the god who, in the Osiris myth, killed his brother Osiris to take the throne, was said to have red hair. In fact, Red does seem to have a lot of associations with both Seth and his domain, the desert. So the reason it kind of had uh, associations with the desert is is partly because the desert is uh, really hot, like fire, and also because if you think in the the morning and when the sun is dawning, the the sand tends to sort of glow, sort of a reddish colour. But either way, as such, uh, Red became associated with all things the desert and Seth betrayed to the ancient Egyptians, such as, you know, chaos, hostility, disorder, violence and pain. And there was even a saying in ancient Egypt, doing red things, which essentially meant doing evil things. I should probably just say, um... There is more to Seth than just this. He was actually a very three-dimensional and well-respected deity, but these aspects of him were still very prevalent. Uh, I suppose the the best way of putting it would be um, 
I feel like, uh, especially in Western society, when we, we think of, of God, we think of um, a divine being who is absolutely perfect in every single way. This wasn't typically how gods were viewed in, in ancient cultures. Normally, um, gods had their own uh, strengths and weaknesses um, as well, just like mortals did. Going back to blood, interestingly as well, especially when we get to the Ptolemaic period, um, so so kind of the, the last phase of pharaonic Egypt when the likes of uh, Cleopatra were ruling, blood started to get used in red ink as well. Although it is worth noting that blood in, in ink was not always due to magic. After all, <laughs> unsurprising, it's also just a, a, a very practical way of getting the colour red, if you think about it. However, there does seem to be some evidence um, of blood being used in this way to kind of like repel harmful forces as well. Again, going back to the idea that it was seen as uh, kind of unclean. It's also worth noting that throughout the film, there are several instances where we see lioness statues. The most well-known lioness god was Sekhmet, a warrior goddess and, well, in Egyptian mythology, she was one of the daughters of Ra, the sun god. In one of the most popular myths surrounding Sekhmet, Ra sends her to Earth to kill those who are conspiring against him. However, after fulfilling this wish, Sekhmet has gained a thirst for blood and violence and goes on a massive killing spree, almost wiping out humanity. Ra and the, the other gods, in order to stop her, dye a load of beer red and then Sekhmet begins to like drink it, thinking it's blood. As she does, uh, she becomes kind of more placid as she becomes drunker and her rage subsides. So I guess if you are being very kind, you could say that Abel was using blood because it was linked to Sekhmet. After all, we do see a lot of depictions of her in the tomb. But <laughs> by the same token, at several points in the film, they show an image of Sekhmet and then they have a strange dog creature, which I'm guessing is supposed to be Anubis appear. So realistically, I think they've just gotten confused between lionesses and, and dogs here, which is a really bizarre thing to get confused. Basically put, I have probably put a lot more, you know, work into making this accurate than the filmmakers have or even deserve. Anyway, uh, moving on. When they arrive at the tomb in the film, the entrance has an image of the Big Dipper on it. You know, the, uh, the, the star system in the sky, if you like. Maggie and Abel um, both agree that the Egyptians were aware of the, the Big Dipper, and they referred to it as the Plough. Right, okay. First things first, yes, the ancient Egyptians were aware of the Big Dipper. This is true, and in fact, you can find it depicted on quite a few Middle Kingdom coffins. So, um, the Middle Kingdom was uh, the time period between, sort of like, um, 2000-ish BC until around about 1780 BC, very roughly. However, the Egyptians did not associate it with a plough. Instead, it was said to be like the foreleg of an ox or a, a bull, if you will. And interestingly, it is also said to be the foreleg of Seth, the, uh, the god we were talking about earlier, the one who's uh, related to the colour red and the, the desert. So, <laughs> okay. Let's, let's just get this straight. They use blood magic. The colour red, as we have said, is highly associated with Seth. They are talking about the Big Dipper, which was seen as the foreleg of Seth. And yet in the tomb, there are loads of images of Sekhmet, which the film mistakes for Anubis. I feel like they may have missed an opportunity here, <laughs> realistically. But I guess, uh, considering that the various stars in the Big Dipper on the door act as buttons that can be pushed like a key code to open the door, I'm going to say that accuracy was not high on their list. At one point in the film, Abel briefly mentions working on a site called Wadi Halfa. He then specifies that this is in North Sudan. He is correct. Not only is Wadi Halfa in North Sudan, quite close to the border of Egypt, but across the water from it, incredibly nearby, is an Egyptian settlement called Buhen. So not only is it a site in, in uh, Sudan, it absolutely is a site that's had quite a lot of excavation done there as well. 
And actually, there's been some really interesting finds there. So, Buhen, as said, was an Egyptian settlement which lasted all the way from the Old Kingdom through to the Roman period. So we're talking about a time period of over 2,500 years, a really long time. Interestingly as well, the earliest ever horse skeleton found in an Egyptian settlement came from here. This seems to have dated to roughly around about 1,675-ish BC, so during a time period called the, the Second Intermediate Period. This was the time just before the New Kingdom, where you get the likes of, you know, like uh, Tutankhamun and uh, Ramesses II. Well, actually, all of the, all 11 pharaohs called Ramesses for that matter. So, to explain this horse skeleton a little bit, um, at Buhen, there was a fortress that got burned down during the Second Intermediate Period. And then, during the New Kingdom, a new fortress was built over the top of it. The horse skeleton was found in the rubble of the original fortress, just beneath the New Kingdom one. This means we can be pretty certain of the date, as, well, essentially the horse skeleton was found in the, the layer of destruction, meaning that it almost certainly died when the, uh, the fortress was being destroyed. Now, you may be thinking the horse got used in the battle during the time when the fortress got burned down. However, this is actually incredibly unlikely. During this time period, so again, the, the second intermediate period, Horses were predominantly used to pull chariots, and at this time the technology for chariots had not advanced far enough for them to be used in war. Instead, they were prized possessions, sometimes used for in like hunting, and also used for, for things like official visits. Essentially, they were a, a status symbol. Anyway, finally in the film, when they find the body of the deceased in the tomb, they are buried with some scrolls. In ancient Egypt, bodies were buried with copies of the Book of the Dead. Uh, this text in ancient Egypt was actually called the Book of Going Forth by Day. It was basically a collection of texts, none of which are completely the same, which were designed to assist the deceased in their journey to the afterlife. The, the Book of the Dead originated from the New Kingdom and lasted through to the end of the Ptolemaic period. So we're talking a, a time period of about 1,000 500-ish years, probably just a little bit more than that. I suppose we could argue that this gives some idea of um, when this tomb is supposed to be uh, be from. Though, once again, <laughs> Abel then uses these scrolls to kill the people in the tomb, so they haven't really got the purpose of them correct here. <laughs> so, overall, does this film do a good job with historical accuracy? Shocking as it may be, no. Normally, I would not be annoyed by this as, well, I mean, films are designed to be entertaining more than anything, and also because a lot of the films that inspired me to actually become an Egyptologist, such as uh, The Mummy and the Mummy Returns and Raiders of the Lost Ark, are not exactly accurate either. But this one is inaccurate to me in a really annoying way, because there are little things they could have just tweaked to make it more accurate. For instance, they had images of Sekhmet throughout the tomb, and at one point, Abel even calls the deceased in the tomb the, the Daughter of the Sun. Sekhmet was literally the Daughter of the Sun, and yet whenever the god rises and kills everyone, it's Anubis. They also put a lot of focus on blood and have the Big Dipper, which was seen as the foreleg of Seth, and yet there is no hint of Seth in this film. Don't get me wrong, even with those changes, this film would be far from accurate. But nonetheless, it is frustrating. Right, time for the review. And, well, believe it or not, there are actually some positives here. For a start, the beginning of the film is pretty interesting. It starts with a man rushing out of the tomb looking quite frantic. He then starts coughing up weird, like, charcoal-like stuff, and then the man evaporates into thin air. The film then fast-forwards in time, where we have an Egyptologist named Maggie and her colleagues. It is revealed that Maggie is about to be reunited with her long-lost father, who is also a famous Egyptologist. When the man arrives... We realise it is the man we saw evaporate 
a few moments ago. So, I will say, bad acting aside, this was a pretty cool opening. It did genuinely make me, you know, want to see what was going to happen next. We then find out that Maggie's father, who is named Abel, wants to lead them on an expedition into the Valley of the Sorcerer. It was at this point I noticed that a lot of the names here are borrowed from Jewel of the Seven Stars, a a novel by Bram Stoker. Um, So in that novel there is a character called Abel and his daughter is called Margaret, so Maggie. Plus, say, they have the location Valley of the Sorcerer in the book as well, and I probably should specify this location is not a real location, it was purely made up for the book. But either way, it is fair to say that the film has taken a lot of inspiration from here. I quite like as well that Abel always seems a little bit off in this film. Like, you can always tell that something is not quite right with him. And as such, the film does a good job at least, well, at least at the beginning, to keep things mysterious but intriguing. For a start, when their hired guide refuses to take the expedition to the Valley of the Sorcerer, and demands to see their permits to dig, Abel uses ancient blood magic to kill him. This makes it obvious that his plan to lead his daughter and her colleagues on the expedition is not sincere. He has ulterior motives, but, well, as of yet, we don't know why. We don't know what those motives are. Further, when they arrive at the tomb using (laughs) less honest means, I actually quite like the way they get trapped in the tomb. Basically, Libyan forces turn up, and so the expedition are forced to hide in the tomb, closing the door behind them. This is interesting, as it does kind of bring real-world issues into the film. Basically, especially back in 2014 when this film was released, there were, like, you know, off-and-on-again tensions between Libya and Egypt. Therefore, if this tomb was, you know, let's say, close to the border, it does kind of make sense that people might get a little bit twitchy. And in all honesty, this could also explain why Abel was not able to um, secure a a permit to dig. Maybe that's me looking into a little bit too much, but I'd say it's a good point nonetheless. But basically, all of this means that we are halfway into the film and, well, I'm still invested. Kind of insane when you think about it, considering, well, this is basically just a knockoff film. Further, there are some parts of this film that are, you know, just kind of funny, albeit for the, you know, not for the right reasons. For a start, when the film attempts to do any kind of character development, it usually does it in a very jarring way without any build-up whatsoever. It's usually quite extreme, actually. For instance, at one part of the film, our characters are stuck in the tomb. There are people outside with guns waiting for them, and then one of our quote-unquote heroes, I suppose, just lights up a joint and decides to get stoned. I would tell you this character's name, but honestly I have no idea, and I'll get into why a little bit later. But basically, obviously one of the other characters, uh, Veronica, tells her not to do this. I'd say that's a pretty fair thing to say considering, well, you may not want to be stoned when you're in mortal danger. But then this woman just goes, I can do this because I have a prescription. When I was younger, my mother was executed right in front of my eyes. And then I was locked in a cupboard for hours alongside a load of dead bodies. As such, I don't like tight spaces such as this tomb. And I'm sorry, what? Like, I'm not saying that's a bad story for a film. I would definitely feel empathy for anyone who had gone through that. But this backstory came out of nowhere. There was literally no hint of this whatsoever. And honestly, throughout the film, this character's way of showing she is claustrophobic due to, well, essentially, horrible trauma, is just to go, oh, well, that's a bit of a tight space. I'm sure I'll be fine, though. Like, not at one point does she seem like she's even close to freaking out. On top of this, some of the deaths in the film are really bizarre. Like at one point, a character called Kelly is looking at the wall of the tomb where there's an image of a lion, which, well, as we were saying earlier, the film seems to mistake for a dog. Abel is performing some, like, ritual in the other room, and an evil Anubis dog appears with glowing eyes. We see some sort of vague sand fall down, and and Kelly runs off. The next time we see her, 
she's squashed underneath a massive boulder. And I don't mean we see the boulder fall on her. The other characters just walk into the room and, and there she is. It's so badly done, but, well, I guess at least it did make me laugh. Unfortunately, though, when it comes to the acting, I've said on this podcast before, I, f I feel there are, like, two types of bad acting. You get the, the charming type, which is bad, but also quite funny. And then you get acting, which is just bad and annoying. For the most part, both the acting and, and the script, for that matter, fall into this second category. Also, although I was able to forgive the shortcomings of the film during the first half, largely because it was at least keeping my attention, my interest really nosedived in the second half. There were several reasons for this, I feel. The first is because I kept getting all the characters confused. Bear in mind, I was literally paying attention and taking notes. I was writing down the names of the characters with short descriptions next to them, but everyone looked so similar. I mean, right, okay, here are three of my notes. Jerry Grant, blonde hair, makeup. Veronica Corbeck, mildly less blonde hair, makeup. Sarah Winchester, light brown, but slightly blonde hair, makeup. Outside of that, they're all seemingly ab about the same heights. They all wear very similar makeup, so it's not just like they're wearing makeup, it's, it's they're wearing the same kind. And don't get me wrong, there would be no issue if there was just like one cast member that looked like this, but it felt like the director had gone out of his way to make sure that you couldn't differentiate between them at all. And like I said earlier, the, um, the woman with the, the, the tragic backstory, who you know, the one who was um, getting stoned, I don't even know where she turned up in the film. As far as I'm aware, she wasn't introduced at the beginning as part of the team, so she was just kind of suddenly there. Right, so we have the fact that all of the characters look really similar, which is incredibly confusing. But also, I, I guess outside of the stoned woman, none of the characters have very fleshed out backstories. Like, okay, we vaguely know that Maggie and her father have not seen each other for a long time, and we know that they are both Egyptologists, but, well, that's it. And, and bear in mind, they are the two main characters. However, the biggest issue here is that nothing at all is explained. We don't ever find out why Abel uh, needs his daughter to be in the tomb. We don't find out why he's causing all these characters to die. We don't really know if it was if it's him who's doing this or, you know, if he's possessed the whole time. We can make some guesses, I suppose, but to be honest with you, I wouldn't even say they're educated guesses. But essentially, all of this means that I do not care about any of these characters. I do not know any of these characters, and I don't know what is motivating our villain to kill these characters. All of this means that, well, this is basically a film of people walking around and vaguely doing stuff, and, well, that's just not entertaining in any way. So overall, you know, I will give this film its flowers. The first half of the film, whilst hardly outstanding, was at least serviceable. Like, I was genuinely very surprised that it was given a 1.8 on IMDb at this point, and was even considering giving it, like, a, a 5 out of 10. So, you know, hardly amazing, but, but respectable nonetheless. The plot at this point seemed serviceable, and even the bits that weren't great at least had some unintentional humour. You know, such as the incredibly jarring and extreme backstories and some incredibly poorly done deaths. Unfortunately, though, after about the 40-minute mark, the film turned into a complete mess with confusing characters and a lack of motivations for anything that is happening. However, because the first half of this film is okay, I will say that this film is twice as good as American Mummy, which I reviewed a few months back. As such, I am giving it a 2 out of 10. Thank you very much for listening. I certainly hope you enjoyed this episode. If you have, please do like, subscribe, share on social media. If you are going to a wedding, why not wait outside the door until the priest goes? If anyone objects, speak now or forever hold your peace. Then you can just like burst through the door in dramatic fashion going, 
I object! These people are getting married, but they don't even know the original purpose of marriage. Then you can play them my episode on Mummies, uh, the animated film from 2023. I believe it's episode 80 of this podcast. And then they will understand that one of the primary purposes of marriage was actually so that your offspring can sort out your funeral and afterlife. I'm sure they'll really appreciate that. Okay, <laughs> please don't actually do that last one. Honestly, I would feel awful. Maybe instead, um, uh, let's say you are on a trip to Egypt. You are wandering through Karnak. You could loudly exclaim, I heard on the Mummy Movie podcast that this is the biggest temple complex in all of Egypt. And people around you would go, whoa, that's such a cool fact. What gods were worshipped here? And you could go, well, according to that excellent podcast, the Mummy Movie podcast, there were several, but the main ones were Amon, Konsu, and Moot. And they'd go, golly gosh, I'll have to look up this podcast. What was it called again? And you would go, the Mummy Movie Podcast. That's the Mummy Movie Podcast, which can be found on pretty much all good platforms. And basically this way, not only have you promoted the podcast, You've also looked really smart and cool, and you've probably made some really good friends as well. Anyway, thank you very much for listening, and join me next week where once again I shall be joined by guest Jake Fleming, and we shall be looking into the entirely non-Egyptian A-list masterpiece that is Samurai Cop from 1991. I hope you all have a fantastic week, and see you then.